always say that I began my martial arts training at the tender young age of 47. Mm. But I did not go willingly. Okay. What, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, it took my sensei three years to convince me to take some classes with him. Mm -hmm. um, he was my acupuncturist before he became my teacher. I was 44 years old. I was looking for a new acupuncturist. Uh, mine had left town. Another one, unfortunately, had passed away. So I was looking for a new acupuncturist, and one of my clients said, why don't you try this guy? I really like him. And, you know, he's really good. He also can do shiatsu. And I thought, if she likes him, because she was a very picky person, you know, he has to be okay. So I called him. I made an appointment. I went in for my first appointment, and he had um, a, a dojo, a martial arts school, right next to his clinic. It was kind of a little like a duplex situation. Mm. And so I walk into his clinic, and, you know, he's talking to me. And he seemed like a really nice fella, nice guy, nice enough, and seemed to know what he was talking about and doing. So he starts putting needles in, in me, and when he got to my legs – and he started putting needles in my legs, he got a very far away look on his face and he said, you know, with your legs and my coaching, I could, tell you, I could teach you how to kill with these things. So I'm lying on his table going, who thinks like this, <laughs> let alone says it out loud? And I'm thinking, I need to grab my purse and go. But I was literally pinned to the table he had a captive audience. I couldn't move. I had needles mm. sticking out all over me. So I just said, uh, no, thank you. I have absolutely no interest in martial arts. I will save my killer legs for ballet class. What he did not know is that I had had a significant trauma just a few months before I met him, just like, I think it was three or four months, but I didn't tell him. And like a lot of traumas, you know, when you try and get help, people are like, eh, that didn't happen. Oh, you're making it up. It's in your head, blah, blah, blah. You're crazy. Uh, so I just stuffed it deep down inside and pretended everything was fine. And about a year later, it just all came spewing out after I had been triggered. And I mean, I just spiraled down into, I mean, it was crazy town. I call it Sliding down the rabbit hole because that's kind of what it felt like to me. I don't know. PTSD is just such a strange thing, and I'm everybody experiences it differently, you know, and, and depending on the trauma. But I mean, I was really losing it. And of course, my past history of trying to get help didn't work very well, so I didn't want to ask for any help. But I knew intuitively if I went to Mark, my acupuncturist, and told him what had happened, that he would not dismiss me or marginalize me the way everybody else had. So when I did, and I told him the story, um, you know, and he's like, okay, we're going to start treat treating, you know, the symptoms of the PTSD, blah, 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 blah. But then his campaign to get me on the mat and train with him went into high gear. And I kept saying no. And he says, you don't, you don't understand. It'll give you your power back and it'll do this. And I said, I don't understand how hanging out in a smelly dojo with a bunch of sweaty men trying to hit me and beat me up is going to make me feel any better, but thanks anyway. And he says, no, you don't understand. There is such a healing power, power in martial arts. And I just kept saying no until it took a total of three years. So another two years after that, they call me stubborn. This man never gave up. He just kept saying, you know, just try it, try it. So I told him, okay, I was going to try a few classes. He wore me down just to prove to him how much I was going to hate it. Well, I didn't hate it. I fell in love with the art. I fell in love with the training. And I really fell in love with the sense of empowerment that I got from the training. And 10 years later, I became his first female black belt. In 20 years of training, he never had a woman achieve such a high rank. Since that time, that was 30 years ago. Was it 30? No, it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Since that time, um, he has not had another woman achieve that high of a rank. So, And what was the martial art? It's called Ninpo Taijutsu, uh, the art of the ninja and the samurai. So it's an ancient Japanese, traditional ancient Japanese martial art. Oh, very, very um, classical, like a classic. We don't, that's why it takes so long to get earn a black belt you know mm. it takes years where in other arts you can do it in two years sometimes even one mm. and and what else what other impacts did that have on say like your health for instance doing that martial art you know 
I was already fairly strong and flexible, but my flexibility just, it was like exponentially improved. And, you know, you talk about being, when you're 70, you want to be able to move like you do now. My teacher, my sensei is 73 now. And even just, it was like the last class before Christmas, and he was demonstrating something and then he just hit the mat and rolled away. And it's like, how many people in their early 70s can do that? Mm. And the other thing that it did, it gave me, well, such an incredible sense of, of confidence in myself, not because I could take down somebody twice my size and half my age, but just moving through, even through the grocery store and just looking at everybody, paying attention to your environment it is such a powerful tool that I really want to emphasize to the listeners, especially to the women out there, please put your cell phone down, please put it in your purse, put it on silent, turn it off, the world will not end, and start paying attention to your surroundings, everything around you. It's going to completely change your life and make you a lot safer. So that was just a few of the things. And just the ability to be able to move and flow in all of life's challenges um, because life is full of hits and they come in a variety of different ways, being physical, emotional, psychological, financial, and to be able to flow, move, and you know, then come back and counterattack, if you will, it's a powerful skill to have. Yeah, it's interesting. Again, going back to my lower back injury, so... You know, I, I ruptured two discs, I had severe sciatica, I had a dropped foot. I Ugh. couldn't, you know, I couldn't walk properly. I had to drag my left leg along as I was walking. I couldn't get shoes or socks on. Luckily, it happened when the weather was warm. And I remember, so I couldn't drive. You know, I couldn't even sit in a chair. I remember I had to walk to the end of my road where I was living at the time in, in London, catch a bus to my doctors and then get a bus back but just walking from my home to the bus stop so I'm walking along dragging my left leg and I thought an eight-year-old girl could attack me now and I would be completely defenseless and I felt so vulnerable because you know first of all you know I'm in reasonable shape right so unless some guy was massive, I could, to some degree, protect myself. But obviously, the best thing is to run away. Right? It's best to never get into a physical conflict because you never know someone might have a knife or whatever. But I'm also a very fast runner. Even now, I'm still very fast. Mm -hmm. So I've always, I think, subconsciously had that in my mind. A, I can run really fast. And B, if I had to get to a fight, I could. Mm -hmm. But then when I had this back injury, I just felt so vulnerable. Right? And that, what that did for me, again, it just made me think how important it is to stay functional because, you know, and then I was thinking about lots of old people that you see walking around and you think, wow, they must feel so vulnerable mm. because, you know, if they are attacked in some way, there's absolutely nothing they can do to protect themselves. And, you know, it kind of saddens me when I see people living lifestyles that means it's going to be inevitable that once they get to a certain age, even maybe my age, that they're going to be in that position, whether it's because they're, you know, super obese and they can't move or they've got arthritis or whatever it might be, you know, they're in pain or, you know, if they try to run away from someone, they probably have a heart attack. You know, it just shows you how important it is to look after yourself and to be healthy because, you know, the main, the main thing I try and push on people is, it's your quality of life that improves. The healthier you are, the more functional you are, the more options you've got. You, if you say, I want to go and do this, I want to go and do that, you can just go and do it. But if you're in pain or if you're super obese or, or you know, you've got an illness, you're very limited in terms of what choices you've got in life, right? Mm -hmm. But going through that experience made it even more important to me or made me realize even more important not just about quality of life but also not feeling vulnerable i'm really glad you brought that up because um yeah that's a really very uncomfortable feeling mm. of being vulnerable and that's exactly what predators are looking for 